we're going to have our worship for the mayor of London for us. She's going to address us, but as the mayor, she's able to go, she doesn't get involved in issues like this. So she's only going to welcome us to sunny, good, breezy, welcome for us. Our worship for us. Um, what it is about What we can do about it, or how it's happening, why it's happening, what we can do about it. Uh, I'm also interested because, as the mayor, I raise money for some charities, and the charities I've chosen this year are to do with young people. And they are charities that that offer ways or that teach young people ways of expressing themselves, fruitfully and creatively, such as drama, music, dance. And, but I am especially um, grateful to Mr. Richard Taylor, who, who has come here this evening and I've had a good talk already. Um, I have a great deal of admiration for Mr. Taylor, who um, had the tragic event of his own son being forced to violence by other children. And when you lose a child, it must be the most beautiful thing to have to live with. sense of responsibility and this serious burden, uh, just like Councillor Anne has said, uh, I'm a medical doctor, I work on the uh, a and &E emergency services, and we deal with this issue when they bring people bleeding from knife and uh, gun crimes, uh, and uh, day in and day out is, um, is a major issue uh, that we deal with to try and save people's lives uh, and many a time you don't succeed and it leaves you with a great horror. Uh, it was one of the reasons why we decided to um, uh, embark on this, to be a voice on this um, uh, major, major problem. Before we go on, I would really, if you don't mind, um, 
really ask for one minute silence for all the people who have died from this. Mr. Taylor has a first hand uh, experience, and uh, it would be important if we can just, you know, have one minute to pause and, you know, ponder what has happened, and then we can carry on. It's a mark of respect and also a humility to show us that this is real, is in our community, because a lot of people are dying and have died from this. So if you don't mind uh, to observe one minute silence, the number of the people who have, may have died. Okay. May their soul rest in perfect peace. Amen. Amen. Um, Looking at the background of the problem, uh, knife and gun crime has become uh, a major, major problem in London uh, and you know, around the country. Up to April uh, this year, about 51 people have been killed and the over almost 1,300 people on the average uh, have been stabbed. Um, the when you look at most of the people affected, the blacks are more uh, uh, and then the ethnic minority people have been mainly the one affected in London. But outside London, it's more, more of the whites. So this shows that uh, it's something that affects all of us. Uh, it depends on the way you look at it. So uh, one of the statements is that London has become lawless, lawless London. You know, this year, up to this moment, more than 12% of uh, cases had been recorded. And since 2008, it looks like the average is around uh, 10 to 12% increase every year. So it's been on the increase, this, this problem. And uh, virtually every day, if you listen to news, every day you wake up in the morning, you must hear that someone had been stabbed somewhere in London. And uh, you, you must know that there's nowhere you are and you're safe. There is no safe heaven. You could be affected anywhere. Um, so looking at this, we could ask ourselves, what actually is a you know, knife and gun crime? What exactly is it? You know, um, some people, some of these uh, are the legal uh, interpretations. If you are carrying a knife or trying to purchase a knife, you are less than 18 or gun, threatening someone with a knife or gun, you know, uh, or carrying a forbidden weapon or in any form, uh, then, you know, a, a murder who, who is, you know, the victim or stabbed. The Met Police has also, since 2008, created this um, uh, killing counting. Uh, graph. Uh, this suggests that you know they are they are expecting another one to happen. So they've created something that will track it. You know, and averagely since 2008, it looks like virtually on the average 10 or a little bit, a little lower, that are killed in every month. You know, that is really, really very scary. Um, and even the economics. Uh, the economist has to publish this, you know, which shows how important this matter has really become. Uh, it would be important to look at so what are some of the causes. Um, uh, one of it is widening social gap. Uh, if we look at our communities, the rich, and the poor, they are at different poles, and um, this is fueling. You know, people not being, they don't expect that there's something they could achieve. So they resort to crime. Uh, poverty and social exclusion is very, very uh, big part of uh, this. Bridging the austerity measures, poor housing, low police numbers, um, you know, courting costs. Virtually everything is being caught, you know, by the government trying to fix one thing or the other, but it's actually causing more problems. Drugs and alcohol is the big one. Um, it's easy to get hands on drugs, you know, in the streets, uh, in the corners. Alcohol, people just drink, and <coughs> if they have those weapons we, we saw earlier on in their pockets, 
and they're drunk, you can imagine what will happen. Peer pressure, lack of education. You know, uh, some people think it's cool to carry knives and uh, they think uh, when you carry these weapons, then you become um, uh, very cool and uh, uh, you're protected. But that is really wrong. Um, family crisis. Uh, single parenting is putting a lot of pressure on looking after the kids. Um, you know, divorce rate is on the increase, the family is in disarray, domestic violence, and so on and so forth. Um, especially for us who are ethnic minorities, uh, family crisis, people working long hours, they don't have time for their children because they have to meet, you know, um, bills, which again goes to the social exclusion and poverty issues, austerity measures. So uh, unemployment, lack of opportunities, you know, uh, and, you know, easy access to weapons. So when you look at this, they are not, the, the list is endless. There are so many other causes which uh, I'm sure that um, we know so many of the causes. But these are some of the snapshots of all the interlinks of some of the other things that... Um, uh, you know, cause these problems, and hopefully, if they are addressed, we hope that would um, make a difference. Consequences of knife and gun crime. Uh, you know, premature deaths. The youths, you know, are the ones uh, that are dying, and in our culture, is a terrible thing for the Igbos. If your child dies, is one of the worst things that can happen to you. Uh, the, the youths are the leaders of tomorrow. So if the children die, then there's no tomorrow. And I'm sure that in every culture, uh, uh, is the same. If all our youths die off, then we don't have future. So premature death is serious. Serial disabilities, life-changing injuries. You know, um, I, I know people who have terrible stabbings, uh, they're not able to use their hands or legs. They have to have, you know, crutches or other things um, to, to walk if they are lucky to be alive. Uh, mental health issues, uh, you know, <coughs> um, PTSD is, uh, is on the rise. If you're stabbed, you're scared, you're, you know, you don't want to. Post-traumatic stress disorders is very common. Fear, anxiety is gripping everyone, uh, especially... You know, if you're getting out, I, 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 we were, you know, having a pre-event interview, and the person interviewing us, the next day neighbor, this son who came from the university, just came in and shared that life story. He came in and he, he said, oh, dad, I just want to go to a youth club or a community event, uh, and uh, it was used to help people. The father gave him some money for transport. He said he was coming back. A few hours later, he was dead. He was stabbed and, and killed. So, uh, 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 school dropout, unemployment, community disunity, chaos, violence, you know, NHS pressure, where we work over 4,000 admissions because of knife and gun crime in 2016. Um, there's so many consequences. Uh, people are easily convicted, they have convictions and they find it difficult to access anything. Um, it, 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 there's so much problems. Uh, it would be important to look at how can we try and stop this you know, uh, problem. Uh, creating awareness, seminars like we're doing today, massive campaigns, social media, advanced TVs, newspapers would be very important and strategic community organization involvement just like us uh, and uh, you know the trust like Damilola Taylor's um, you know education in schools using leaflets uh, billboards music I think will be very very important with celebrities you know if we get them singing uh, and telling the youths they will listen you know instantly so I think it's a good one churches charities uh, would play key roles, families, um, you know, family involvement, because if we get the families involved, it will actually go a long way to helping us um, 
Then the government is a big one, funding, clear government policy, and uniting all the groups will be very, very critical in trying to make sure that all the efforts work together. Because what is happening at the moment is that we have pockets of you know, activities that are not well coordinated. So if we get government um, you know, coordinating things, it will be very, very helpful um, in this regard. Now, some of our recommendations for winning this war, we call it a war uh, because we think that it's a major, is major, major issue. And if we elevate it to a war a strategy, this could help us to win it. Improve government funding would be very crit critical. Uh, better and comprehensive government policies will go a long way to uh, making sure that this um, uh, problem is, is uh, stemmed. Involvement of parents, families, faith groups, community organizations, charities, you name it, will be very, very important. Dealing with illicit drug and alcohol problems will be very strategic. Uh, inclusiveness of the society, I think, will go a long way to reassure people and give people hope. More education, reigning uh, and creation of egalitarian society, uh, and also using media, social media, all sorts of media, print, uh, audio, uh, would really, really, if they all work together, uh, we pass the message on Twitter. That would be a good one. You know, tweeting Facebook, making sure that people hear about this all the time. So we hope that um, all this will work together. In summary, we think knife and gun crime is a major problem in our society, especially in London. And that's why we've stopped in to join um, in this um, to speak out. So Haneze Ndibo, you can joining today to speak out against this problem and suggesting a full-scale uh, war is declared against it. All of us are affected regardless of race, regardless of color, gender, occupation, background, or whatever social stratification you are in. We are all in it together. And I would conclude by you know, suggesting that um, a full and comprehensive joint action plans and implementation must have to start now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Nan Naigwe, the president of Ohaneze. I'll use this opportunity to acknowledge and um, I think a few Ohanese executives that have come in. I can see our queen sitting down there. She's the female first vice president, is it? Correct me if I'm wrong. The female vice president of Ohanese. Um, welcome to Welcome Forest. Um, next item on the agenda is actually vice. to deliver this seminar. Um, apologies for lateness for those who are still on their way because I'm continuously receiving text messages. People are saying that they're held up in traffic. They left work in good time thinking they'll be here, but the traffic is so much. I think I've got about 12 messages. But unfortunately, we have to start because the mayor is in the house and we've got some dignitaries that are in the house. So they'll join us whenever they get here. Um, the reason I'm speaking on this is a couple of years ago, I've actually um, been a junior cabinet member and holding the portfolio for um, domestic violence and working for us. And during that time, you know, um, a lot of things was happening and it hinges on this issue. But between me and the lead member, my colleague, Councillor Hassan Khan, he'll be looking at it, taking, at it, take, taking it from borough based perspective, but I'll be looking at it from London based. The key facts around knife crime in London. Since 2014, knife crime has been increasing both 
across London and East-West. It has increased by 24% across England and Wales. In 2017, it was 367 across the NPS. Victims of this make up nearly half of them are under 25. In fact, 25 years of age. So 75% of these are male. And almost half of this figure are the black African minority ethnic. Offenders make up 50% under 25. 90% of these are male to test BME. There were 81 related um, knife homicide during 2017, plus 22, plus 20 in 2016. Young under 25 African Caribbean male knife crime victims make up 41%. 31 of 73 victims of London um, knife homicide in 2017, excluding terrorists and domestic issue, yet they make up only one point percent of the London population. We make up the lowest population, but the crime rate is high. Currently, around a quarter of residents feel knife crime, 26 percent, and gangs are 23 percent of this, are a problem in their area. So wherever you live, majority, you know, people, that's the feelings they are having. This increase, this increased during each quarter, during the Fiscal year of 2017 and 2018. Unfortunately, my iPad, these figures should have been projected up there, but somehow it's not compatible with the, the system. So I'm having to pull it out here. If anyone wants me to send them this, just leave your email address and I'll send the statistics across to you. So the highest results are seen in happening where knife crime is 37%, gangs is 42%, and the lowest results are seen in Barnet, where knife crime is 12%, compared that to Hackney, where you have 42%, and the gangs is 9%. The question is, why? Why is it lower in Barnet, and why is it higher in Hackney? So those are the discussion people should be having, and benchmarking, if there's anything Barnet is doing differently, or they are doing that is better, that can be copied, you know, in boroughs where the statistics are higher. The data on knife crime opens up place-based um, place solution to borough ward level. A fifth of London wards experienced weapon-related murder in 12 months, gun or knife-related. Just 12 wards were affected by both gun and knife-related homicide during the same period. Of those, five were within London's most vulnerable wards. Nearly half of all knife murder offenders resided within the same borough as they offended within. Just over 10% live within the same ward as the offense took place. Where, where offenders have traveled, this is often due to having links to the area and living elsewhere. What they're trying to say is, for offenders, they often commit this within their comfort zone, within the area they live. The only time they venture out is either they have a link there or they have someone that have actually asked them to come. They rarely travel from their comfort where they live and go and commit an offense in an unknown place. It's a very rare occasion. It happens in a very rare occasion. I don't think there's any statistics that has captured that. There is um, a table here which I'm going to read out. This is about the whole London borough. We have 42 boroughs that make up London. And we have the statistics for 2017 and 2018. And I will, if everybody leaves their email address, send this across to them. It started with Sodok. Between 2017 and 18, we have 866. Compare that to Kingston upon Thames, the same year, where they have 92. That's a huge difference. There must be something Kingston upon Thames are doing. The government, ourselves, elected people need to look at that. 
But let me run through the whole barrels. I've just gone through from the extreme to the lowest. Haringe followed 794 cases. Newham, within that same period of 2017 and 2018, Newham had 786. Brent, 764. Lambert, 730. Tower Hamlet, 715. The figures are going down. Westminster, 646. Islington, 629. Croydon, Nikki Milike, Nisden College. Croydon, 610. Ely, 475. Barton and Dagenham, 444. Redbridge, 425. Wandsworth, 400. Greenwich, 394. Barnet, 382. Hebrew, 353. Hillenden, 342. Bromley, 331. Hounslow, 307. Cushington and Chelsea, 263. Hammersmith and Fulham, 236. Harrow, 221. Sutton, 202. Merton, Bexley actually, 201. Merton, 187. Richmond of Contains, 127. Upon 10, 92. Knife crime, a lot is known around it. What works is what we want to see. From the tables there, some of the problems have been the things that actually work. Some of the key points that have been raised are education based approaches to demonstrate the dangers of carrying a weapon and making available resources and services to support vulnerable young people. Skill-based programs that aim to develop ability to control behavior and participate in good social activities. Partnership with partnership key along with tackling wider issue of interpersonal violence. Family focused program such as home visits, parent training, family therapy. This has been shown to work in preventing gang involvement and youth violence. Who delivers education program is quite crucial. Preferably it should be those who can engage well with young people and have direct experience of night crime, knife crime, either as a perpetrator, victim, family or community member. The police also have a role to play. Now let's look at what doesn't work. A few of the key points that have been identified as the points that doesn't really work. Knife, crime, amnesties have proved ineffective alone. They do not address underlying causes and give and given the ready availability of knives have a limited effect. The media and knife crime amnesty have a role to play in awareness raising. However, only when delivered alongside wider education, educational measures. There is no evidence for schemes such as boot camps or other shock incarceration programs such as scared straight. These deterrents and disciplines, uh, discipline style intervention have been recognized as ineffective or potentially harmful, as people see it as purity. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's nice we're beginning to have a talk around this. As Dr. Nan Naibe has said, we need to tackle it head on because it's on the increase. If nothing is done, the problem will continue. And within us, somehow we know somebody who has been affected. If not directly to us, but we share the same empathy. What Una and I have shared here, the young guy in question, I know the mother. The 
guy finished his um, first degree last year in July, graduated like any other person, part of um, a youth club somewhere in Stratford. Came in, and the father was actually in the kitchen. The father said, sit down and eat. He said, oh, I just want to go down the road. Give me some money to top up my master. I need two pounds. The father said, oh, I have some coins in the plate. I just go there and take four pounds. He said, no, dad, I'll take two pounds. At the door, he said to dad, I'll see you later. Dad said, when are you coming back? He said, half an hour. The dad waited. When he had the knock on the door, because he found the light down the door and his phone to come and announce to him that the son has been preparing food for, that he has just attended his graduation has been starved fatally. By the time on their way, I think they communicated with the police that the dad has died. This is a 21 year old boy. The mother has been controlling. The effect on her. Every time I talk to her, it brings me to tears. Because these are things you cannot imagine. She cannot have a son. <clears throat> and when I listen to her, I tell you, personally, even as a clinician, I still break down. Because it's not a match. He's not in a gang. He's a boy that comes from a good book. It's nearly a year now. He's out. We need to address this issue. However, we can do it to stop it. Thank you. As, as Anna and the doctor have already spoken, it is a very complex uh, issue, and there is no silver bullet. It's very much local government working with Chile and government to try and find a kind of solution. But at the heart of that solution, has got to be the um, so I'm really just going to talk about some of the work we've done as a borough around trying to, 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 to tackle this uh, issue head on as, as Anna has just described. Just before I kick off, I'd just like to forward apologies for the leader of the council who was due to attend, but unfortunately has had to uh, attend uh, another event and, and he's very well it's, it's not going to make it here today. In, in terms of uh, tackling youth violence, gangs, my crime, gun crime. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very difficult issue. Um, and before you embark on putting together strategies around how you deal with the problem, you've really got to understand the problem that you're dealing with. So we've voiced what we need to the rest of London. Like London, we have seen not, uh, a rise in knife crime, in new violence. Um, we have a problem with gangs. And what we did is we commissioned a professor from the university in 2007, Professor John Hitz, who gave us a baseline uh, understanding of the gangs operating in our borough. Um, last year, we commissioned London South Bank University to build on the work of Professor John Hitz and look at the profile of our gangs in 2017-18. And there was quite a big difference in that in 2007, Professor John Pitts reported back as part of his study that the modus operandi of gangs at that time within the forest was very much focused on postcodes, very much focused on their estate, very much focused on a patch. And they were very territorial. So when, when gangs were sort of going between the different uh, postcodes or estates, we will see the spate of violence. Fast forwarding 10 years later, 2017-18, the London South Bank University study tells us that the, the, the primary focus of gangs is no longer focused around postcodes, but now around profit, profit from drug dealing. So the title of the council report uh, that we commissioned from London South University is from postcodes to profit. And that just shows the transition 
the gangs have gone through from focusing on territory now to focusing on a much more ruthless model of profit. A lot of that profit they focus on is something that you may have heard about around county lines models. And that's very much focused on understanding that London is very saturated, uh, the numbers of police officers are, are relatively high, uh, and you have more chance of being caught. So a lot of the gangs now are going into some of the towns outside of London to sell drugs. Um, and previously, uh, whilst sort of the, the postcode models, uh, whilst the focus was on postcodes, we saw violence, but probably not as extreme violence as we're now starting to see. So you know, the, the knife crime and gun crime is sentencing increase. Uh, and again, we're not unique with that. Uh, in, you know, across London, a lot of the gangs now are operating in what is called the county lines model. So we got a really good idea of the model that the gangs are now using, the numbers of gangs within the borough, the numbers of individuals within them gangs, uh, and, and some interesting highlights coming through the report, which again showed a big, diff, big shift uh, when compared to 2000, 2000, 2007 and 2017, was the, the now use of younger people to transport drugs and the use of women, young women, to transport drugs because they would uh, stay under the radar from the police. Uh, there were less crimes being stopped and searched. And women specifically, because of the lack of new police officers, they, they, was, they, they were unlikely to be stopped as part of their transporting drugs journey. That combined with factors that Dr. spoke about earlier, poverty, inequality, exclusion of school, um, you know, gave us some reasons uh, for young people getting involved in gangs in the first place, different from vulnerabilities. So in terms of responding to the London South University study, the council put forward uh, our response uh, only last month. Uh, and so what we pledged to do was invest a further 800,000 in the next four years on top of the current two point two million that we already invested in early help. And that's around focusing on how we support families to ensure they are resilient and have the skills and tools uh, to ensure young people reach their full potential uh, and do not get involved into gangs or in violence. So we've managed to retain our children's centres, and a lot of that work, when I say early help, starts very much from conception. So working with single parent households, households who are aware of substance misuse being uh, involved, where we're getting involved very early and offering our support to those families and individuals in some instances. We accept we are not going to enforce a way out of the problem, but enforcement does have a role to play. And that's why uh, what we will be setting up at a borough level is a um, financial recovery unit where, where we can prove that gang members have purchased items through means they cannot prove, we will be able to take them assets of work. And there are examples within our report from London University of gangs having purchased vice their property. So you know they have lots of money they they're able to purchase quite you know expensive assets. The public health approach is very important as part of our response. So there's a real focus on ensuring substance industry services are responsive and alongside that mental health services. So what we'll be piloting in this borough, working with the NHS, is to offer all gang members and all those on the periphery of gangs a mental health assessment when we come in touch with them. And that's something quite unique that we're piloting at a borough level. But just bringing back to what I opened with in terms of the role of the community, the council will not solve this problem at all. We can, you know, we can put aside resources, we can 
put together these really interesting strategies. Um, we can work very closely with the police and have real sort of multi-agency working. But ultimately, the community has a really important role to play and has got to be at the heart of our strategy. And it is very much at the heart of our strategy. So we have a community group, um, various community groups that we're working with as part of our response. Uh, and a lot of that work involves these community groups going out there, getting, working with young people. So a lot of the times there's trust deficits with young people in the council. There's trust, trust deficits between young people and the police. And that's where the community groups can go into these communities and work with these young people because they have the will of the young people there to trust the We're working very closely with the GLA and we've put together a bid that we will be putting forward as part of the London Youth Fund. Um, and we're looking with interest in terms of what the government's response is around this issue. Because as Anna said, it's not an Indian Forest issue, not a London issue, it's an issue right across London, England and Wales based on the increase in crime we've seen. So the government have set aside £40 million um, around tackling this issue uh, and we'll be seeing how we can work with the government uh, to add resources to our uh, offer at a local level. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there um, as part of the discussion later, happy to pick up any uh, questions, um, happy to hear your insights. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Mr. Richard Taylor, uh, who you know, has done a lot of work around this, this issue. Um, and just to finish by saying thank you, uh, Andrew, again for organising this event, which gives us as uh, politicians an opportunity to hear your views around how we tackle uh, the menace of gangs. Um, in our borough and right across London. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and then we also have a doctor, Dudu. She is, I've known her, but I've said to her, she does so many things. I said, you just have to do that what you're doing related to this. She works with youth. She is the founder, she's Dudu Ukube, that pronounced that name. She's the founder of the Youth Matrix, an establishment devoted to offering unwavering support and assistance to help the youth recognize their own world. She's here today with the three youths. And I'm going to jig the agenda item around a bit. We'll be listening to person young man who has experienced violence of the knife three weeks ago and we thank God there was no fatality he is here to give us an account of his experience. Uh, Baba Tule is in Dukoya. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I'd like to thank um, the gentleman right here for giving us a platform to kind of have dialogue between the youth and basically just speak on things that are very important, especially um, issues such as this uh, plaguing our society. So um, my name is Babatunde Olukoya. I'm 22 years of age. I go to University of Kent where I study law in my second year. Um, three weeks ago, I was coming back from the bank and I thought to myself, I said, let me take a shortcut. If I take a shortcut, I'll be able to get home quicker. If I get home quicker, I can do my laundry, all that, and get out of the way easy. So on this day, I took a shortcut. As I was walking, there were three guys waiting, just waiting, they were kind of lounging around. Two Africans, one Caucasian. So they started questioning me, instantly. You know, they were looking at me. I could tell from their body language that they kind of had a, an issue with me. And what I thought in that moment was, it's not possible for you not to know someone and have an issue with them instantly. So they started talking and inquiring with me about where I'm from, where, what my name is, where I'm from. Like, maybe they had that idea that I was someone else. So I told them that if you believe I'm someone else, you're wrong. You're mistaken. Like, I'm a student. Like, I'm not, I, 
I'm usually not here at this time. They're like, yeah, it's him, it's him. And before I knew it, I was being pummeled, you know, I was being beaten. And yeah, I was, I was put in a, in a very tough situation, which resulted in me having um, a fractured jaw on my right, my right lower mandible and a lower fractured jaw on my left cheek. So I had two fractures, which ended in me having to go for surgery and gain two metal plates, actually three metal plates. And um, I had an incident that same day where the bottle was broken on my head. And um, the doctor said that if this bottle had hit the, the wrong side of my brain, I would have actually been um, retarded. So from that experience, I learned, I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot of things about, about um, the youth. I felt like that experience, God wanted me to go through it, to understand what people deal with, you know, in the inner cities, because that was very strange to me. I used to hear about, okay, people getting stabbed, people getting beaten up, but until I experienced it, that's when, when I understood. And after I experienced that and I was in the hospital for two days, shortly after my surgery, I would look in the mirror and I would see that my right jaw would, would be hanging down and it would be affecting my swallowing. And when I used to look in the mirror every day, I look at my reflection and see how deformed I was. I was filled with hatred. I really hated the people who did that to me, especially given the fact that they really didn't know me. So I was really pained that you guys are young black men. I'm a young black man like you. Is there any reason for you to do this to me? Even if you thought I was someone else, we can communicate, but that's something that didn't happen. So I felt, I felt really vengeful and I really wanted to take matters into my own hands. Um, I didn't talk to the police. I wanted to take matters into my own hands because I felt like they needed karma. And being in that hospital, sitting down, I understood that. Why are you revenging? Like, what will you gain from getting revenge? Obviously, these, these youth, they're lost in another type of life. And you, you're, you're awake enough to know that this is not gonna waste, this is gonna waste your time. It's not gonna get your mother into a better situation. It's not gonna get you better grades. It's a complete waste of your time to even go and react. So it was extremely hard for, for me to turn the other cheek and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna let go and let God take full control. That was extremely hard for me, but it was, it was God that was my crutch in that moment. I recovered and I fully recovered right now. But the, the trauma that I experienced from being in that situation, that trauma was what took a much larger amount of time for it to be deleted from my, from my brain, basically. But that situation breathed a new fire into my, my life and it breathed in me the fire to, to to curb this type of activity because I feel like it's something that is um, it's very detrimental to the youth. And the reason why most people do things like this, like, okay, I'm gonna do this to this guy, I'm gonna do this, is over things that are really minute. So people lose their lives on a daily basis for small spats and disagreements. So I think that it's very important that we, we put a stop to this because we have to be honest, we're reaching a point where the younger generation is actually, we're basically deleting each other out of existence. We're, we're all deleting each other out of existence and it's happening at an increasing pace. And there are many things to blame for it. A lot of people say you can blame rap music. A lot of people say you can, you can blame where they were brought up, like, because people are a product of their society. But I feel like what is gonna save the youth at this point in time is more youth, youth centers. Like these, a lot of these boys who are involved in these gang activities, they have nowhere to exert this youthful energy. So they're all in the wrong direction. They're all saying, okay, we're gonna do this to this guy over something irrelevant. So I feel like if we, we bring like, um, I like to say like an outpouring of youth centers, you know, and we, we actually fund youth centers. I think that, that that's something that would be very helpful. And just like you said, the, the mental, um, giving them a mental evaluation, because most of these young men, they're actually traumatized from an experience. Some of them have been abused, and 
they feel like the best way to deal with that trauma is to, I'm gonna take out on someone else. So, and another thing I wanted to address is also um, the fact that, not to defend these youth, but some of them are actually just boys that are lost. I saw it for myself, so like, most of them are just very lost. So they need, when there's no role models, that's the type of situation that we get. And I think that instead of these boys being taken to jail, because I feel like the, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, Code A of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act states that when an officer stops um, an individual, he can do so based on his um, curiosity, based on his suspicion. He has to be in a state where he's He's suspicious enough to conduct the search. But the question I wanted to ask was, what exactly is suspicion? I could see you at night and I could just be like, you look suspicious enough for the search. So I feel like we also need to tackle the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 because it gives space for a lot of um, racial profiling and racial stereotyping of young men who may not even be involved in these activities, but they've been taken to jail and then they come out with that mentality. So this is my experience. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone once again for coming up because things like this actually, well, what, what's going on is very big and I'm very proud to see this gathering because we're actually sewing the society together. Like, so I'd like to thank everyone again for coming. Thank you. Wow, that's very, very moving to listen to someone who is, who had just experienced it not too long ago, three weeks. Thank you for coming, Babatunde. I know you came as a short notice, the invitation. Babatunde, thank you very much for coming. I know you came as a short notice, but you agreed to come and share that. Um, there's a young lady beside you who also wants to briefly share her experience. Do you want to come up? I know you told me your name, but somehow lost in translation. Introduce yourself and um, your age. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Mako Mangena. I'm 20 years old, and I go to Canterbury Rice Church. I'm in my second year studying film, radio, and television with psychology. Um, about two months ago, I witnessed and I aided a victim of knife crime in an area called Grays, um, which is where I'm from. Um, I was walking to meet my mum. She's over there. She's the founder of Youth Matrix. <laughs> I, was over, um, I was walking to meet my mum, and um, I passed Grays train station, and I saw a boy lying down on the steps with his friend and he, he seemed like he was, they seemed like there was something wrong, but I couldn't quite figure out what the situation was, but they just looked, there was something that just didn't seem right to me. So I went over to them and I asked them, are they okay? And his friend who um, was trying to, the, the boy who was lying down was a person that got um, stabbed, uh, he was a victim. His friend was so insistent on not getting any support from anyone. And it was later that I realized that the reason he insisted on not getting support from anyone is because he was worried that if anyone approached him that was maybe an officer or you know someone that was of authority he would be in trouble mainly based on maybe something he was carrying or something like that so um from there i realized that they are up to no good they are young people who are in a situation so then i i walked past i walked i went i went i left them and i walked back and there was something that just didn't feel right to me. I had to, I had to further investigate what was wrong with them. So it's then when I asked more that I saw that the boy had blood coming from his hoodie all the way down to his trousers. He was covered in blood and his friend was trying to hide it and he was trying to push me away. And I said, no, 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 your friend is bleeding. He's losing consciousness. Clearly I could see that he was struggling to, to stay conscious. I need to get support. I said, have you called the ambulance? He said, no, I haven't called the ambulance. Please, please leave us alone. And I said, no, your friend is going to die to death. He's going to bleed to death if I leave you. Um, and then that's when I then ran to the security inside the, the uh, train station. And I said that there's someone who is losing consciousness. Do you have a plaster or something that I could put pressure on to stop the bleeding? 
And the gentleman said to me that no, they didn't have anything. So I then ran back to them and I said, OK, do you have water so we can splash it on his face to keep him conscious? I was trying to remember my first aid training as much as I could. Um, so I said, do you have water we can splash on his face? And then they said, um, yes. So there was a taxi driver nearby that said, yes, we can use water to splash on his face. He then um, was slowly, slowly coming back to consciousness. And that's when the ambulance came and the police came. And that's when they took him away. It's about a week after that I saw in the newspaper that he was a 19-year-old boy who was a victim of a stabbing incident and he had pulverated his bowel. So um, if I hadn't got there in time or if I hadn't called the ambulance, God knows what would have happened to him. But I'm just happy that I was able to aid someone and support them and save their life. So that's my experience. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think what I can take, the lesson we can take from that is wherever we are, we should be aware of our environment. You don't have to be a nurse or a doctor to be able to help to save someone. If you see anything that is out of place, please, it's our responsibility to call for help. Whichever call, if it's an ambulance, because they are now linked. If you call an ambulance and inform them that there has been a stabbing, I tell you, that's just the phone call you have to make because they will link it up with the police. As the ambulance is coming, the police is also following. So please, 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 let us be aware of our environment and be our brothers and sisters keeper. Before I call on the next person who is one of our special guests, I will acknowledge um, some dignitaries that have just come in. Ambassador George Ozongwa of Ohanese and Barrister of four of Ohanese. Welcome to Walking Forest. My, the next speaker is someone that we are all familiar with. We've heard about him. We've shared the experience with him. Not by knowing him one-to-one, -one, but from the media. We empathize. It's, I think, for me, it was one of the first after um, Stephen Lawrence's case, it's one of the ones that have actually hit the headlines. He's here tonight as a father to share with us what it takes to lose a son. Probably to give us advice how or what, well, I don't know how to put it, because as a mother, I'll be speechless. But he's agreed to come and share his experience with us. Please put your hand together for Mr. Richard Taylor. Damilola Taylor's father. I suppose that's the only way people will know. The late Damilola. Thank you very much, sir. Your worship, for the mayor. Uh, was on first. The council official, the councillor, the council official, councillor Ken. Um, the Ohanese of uh, the Indie world in the UK. And my elder Oha over there, I welcome you. And uh, before I say or speak, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Uh, Nick, Nikki Ibrahim for giving me the opportunity here to join with. Uh, this uh, audience of uh, brainstorming. And uh, before I go on, also, I want to thank God for you, Baba Tunde, that you, are, you have escaped uh, a tragedy uh, and uh, God has saved you. 
Um, I'm not going to start uh, talking about the whole story of uh, what uh, uh, happened 18 years ago, but uh, it's uh, something that uh, everyone is aware of. And uh, we, as a family, we have uh, suffered uh, so bitterly over the sudden death of uh, taking away of uh, Damilola Taylor at his tender age. Um, but we thank God today that uh, even though we went through a lot of uh, uh, grief uh, for him and his mom, we thank God today that uh, with uh, the glory of the Almighty on our hand, and on our side, um, he has kept us on to, to face the challenges that uh, is, uh, is uh, going all over the, 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 the city of London. This is uh, a thing that uh, we cherish. We cherish it a lot to see young people uh, attend such a gathering because they are the ones that are affected. We, we, we have uh, had our own life in this country, but they, they are the future, the future generation of this country. And by the time we keep hearing about killing, stabbing, many, damaging of these young people. So what's going to happen? in the future when these young people are to take the mantle from us to run the affairs of uh, this country when we leave. So I am glad that they are here today and uh, I, I want to say today that uh, we will we will we will to work with you, who we'll get your, your, your details from uh, Mrs. Uh, Ibrahim over there, or from your mentor, or from Ohanese, who has put this together, uh, because this is the beginning of good things to come. Because, as thank you, as parents, as a community, as uh, the, I will. I I I just want to individualize uh, uh, at, at this point. As a country that we have, we have migrated from. The government at one point set up a body to to take co control and manage the affairs of uh, its people in this country. And that, is, that was uh, the government of uh, ex-president Olusha Gumabasojo. He set up a group called Kanuk, and, and the other one, Nido. But the concept the, the concept of setting that group up was a very good one. Eventually, things started falling apart, you know, within the, the people that are chosen to run the affairs of those. Uh, so today, those, those uh, groups have not delivered to me they have not delivered the concept of what the government, because there has been a lot of wrangling, a lot of infighting amongst them. They want to be, they want to be leaders of uh, the group. They want to be financial and, you know, you talk about it. <laughs> they want to be holding portfolios and offices. And there was a lot of wrangling, and that has affected. But with this, I am sure that with this little gathering here today and with the concept 
of bringing people together to discuss the, the problem and profound solution because it's affecting our children. Many Nigerian children are affected. I'm sorry, I have to be blunt. A lot that have died are Nigerians, Ghanaians. We don't hear, I'm sorry, uh, about Asian young people stabbing themselves. We only hear of, of our own community because there is a conspiracy somewhere. Because those who are arriving recently, young people, they have brought in a concept of their, in their mind that they are coming to this country to, 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 to succeed quickly, to, to make money. They are on the fast track and they get themselves involved in drugs and music. Um, some of them have been successful with the talent. They are endowed with. But there is conspiracy on the other side, which enables envy to occur. And they also get involved with, with the sale of drugs. Like uh, Baba Tunde experience, you know, I, I want to say one thing to you that, that uh, happened to you that day. You saw the three standing aloof over there. The best thing for you would have been to just take, uh, take uh, another way and just cross. You are, you, are, you are a student lawyer and you've quoted so much of uh, the legal uh, entities there to us today. But we thank God today that you are alive. And that is the kind of thing we will start telling others that we have someone who saw three young people looking around. They were trying to sell drugs and they saw you around there. They thought you are, you've come from, they don't know you. They don't know you that you live around the area. So they thought you have come to, you are not coming to buy from them. You have come to sell. So, so you are taking market away from them. So that's why they stab you, because you cannot explain. What, what's, what's, their, what's, what's their problem to be questioning you? Yeah? If you had had other friends, that is where the palaver would have really escalated, and someone would have lost their life that day. So with Ohaneze, I'm going back to Ohaneze, the, 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 the move to today that I have uh, been privileged to see, you know, we will, we will want more of this, more members of the family, you know, more members of, the, of the, the family to get involved, thank you, to get involved in this, the Ohaneze and the, uh, the counselor and all the members of the Ohaneze uh, should, should be in the front line. Uh, to address this issue. Because if we are not, we are not addressing it, we, are, we, we, we feel, oh, it's not, it's, it doesn't concern me. One day, it will concern some of those that we, we, that are saying it doesn't concern me. But we don't pray. So this is an, an environment for us to start doing something getting ourselves together, we will, we will be in the front line. It's not a question of having meetings and uh, it's a question of bringing every one of us together. Ohaneze is a very powerful, very powerful body in, in Nigeria. I, I, I grew up to know the Ohaneze group in, in uh, Lagos. Because, you know, they, they have a way 
to, to bring themselves in terms of uh, age groups. They work, you know, in age groups. You have your own, you know, age group. If, you, if I make mistake, you can correct me. You're right. <laughs> you have your own age group as you are living, growing up. The age group is where all everything you are doing in your life, they discuss it, they plan your birthdays, they plan your marriages, they, they plan things. They support, there is financial support that is given to the needy, to those that have not been to the university, that is not up to the standard. As, so there is a lot that Ohaneze has been known for. But in this country, everyone is on their own. And it shouldn't be like that. We are supposed to be our brother's keepers. Go to, go to Brick, um, Peckham, you see terrible things happening there. People are not help, you know, they are not concerned about this problem. A, a family whose mother knows that his son or her son is bringing trainers of about 200 pounds home. She, she won't query him. She will just allow him to bring it. For me, I challenge those kind of kids. Where did you get? Where did you get that trainer? You have to explain. Take it back. So, when my children were growing up in Nigeria, I searched their bags when they go to school. In the morning, I searched their bags. And anything that I've uh, found to be alien to what I have, I'll take it out. Where did you find this? So that's how we are being brought up. The present generation of uh, young people, I'm sorry, they lack that aspect of, oh, the, the upbringing is not there. I'm sorry to say, very, very little percentage have, have such uh, um, exposure to proper discipline that we, we went through. I know we are the old school, but uh, at the same time, the young people have to have discipline as they grow up. And my prayer is that for the next generation to succeed in this country, apart from the educational pursuit, the Ohanese has a method by which they work. It's just like the Asians to, to develop uh, the future of uh, their children. There is a glut in the economy at the moment. There is no jobs anymore in this society. We came to this country in the 70s and we were doing many a work. I, I, have, I have vouched that none of my children will ever go and do that kind of job that I did, you know, as a student to make ends meet in this country. This is why we want us to come together as one to develop the future of our children. I was uh, working as a consultant with uh, Working Link. Um, and this, uh, my director was telling me one day, that, oh, I said, I'm, I want to give my son, you know, I want to give him some money. I, she said, how old is he? I said, uh, maybe I think he was about uh, 25 then. I said, what? You are keeping your son who is 25 years old. You are still, and he still is living at home with you. So you are giving him money for what? I said, he needs it. That look, me, she's referring to herself, that at the age of 18, she had started paying to her parents the rent because she was still living at home. And she, her father had stopped giving her any, any um, 
any for, you know, money or whatever they call it now, you know, because there are so many uh, benefits around now that uh, young people have access to. All right. So she said, I should stop giving my son such money so that my son will be able to be independent in his life. So I said, no, I wasn't brought up like that. <laughs> it's because of the upbringing. Because up to now, you know, when I, I left Nigeria, my, my parents were still sending money, you know, to, it's only because uh, at that time, as a student, we wanted to do some other things that we needed money for, go to nightclubs and all that. <laughs> so every one of us have experienced it. But moving on to, from there, and the point I'm going to leave us with is that we should be able to uh, harness all the energy that we have at the moment. There's so much energy in us, you know, that God has endowed us with that, you know, our children, they've taken a cue. Imagine Tunde there and, and the young lady and the young man there. They have an aspiration in life. But we parents, especially we, should be able to manage our, uh, our children. We should be able to bring them up in this country. This is, this is their home. We have no other place. They, they won't go to Nigeria. You are just wasting your money building houses in Nigeria. These kids, they won't go and live in Nigeria. I'm telling you. I have a house in Nigeria, in Lagos. My son went there. And when he, he, he went into it, he said, well, what a waste of money. He's not going to live there. So this is, their, this is where they are going to live. We should be able to you know, provide that, that support for them. University, job, marriage, if they choose to get married, if not, settle down to whatever. Have children, because your parents have had you. <laughs> so some children says they don't want to have children <laughs> in their life, you know. So there are so many things that we need to work upon, you know, that will make life better for our young people as they grow up. So on that note, I want to thank you all again for listening to me and for, for, the, for the mayor and Councillor Khan and all the members of the Ohanese group. You have a mandate tonight. You have to bring us all together. Thank you. Thank you.
So I started working with them because I went to the room and I was there for a while, working with three kids, met the three provinces in um, Tijuana, the three provinces of um, um, Cameroon, they are males. And um, together now, I think we have a building there, empowered children. They have a place where they can go and have one meal a day. So through that charity, I was given that honorary, but through yours was the uh, So I'll be calling you to come and give us a few words with regards to what you're doing with the kids, with the children, and how you started, and what advice you think you can give with regards to moving forward. Please put your hands together for Dr. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I think this is a very much needed um, event or gathering because there's so much happening. Um, my name, as you heard, is um, Dr. Judy Mule. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I came into the UK as a teenager myself. I was 17 years old. I didn't know anybody. My parents just sent me to study over here. I didn't have any relatives. But you know what? I thank God because I stuck to the plan. I unfortunately did not go through what some of my other people have gone through. But I've witnessed a lot. I've watched. And then um, when I was 21, God blessed me with uh, my first daughter, who you had seen earlier. And to be honest, being a 21 year old with no parents in a foreign land, I didn't know what to do with her. She was my first experiment. All the mistakes were done there, all the corrections were done. Yeah. Thank God I did very <laughs> But all of a sudden, time went through by really quickly. Before I knew it, she was a teenager. And um, I didn't know what to do. There was a big change. Going through all the <coughs> slamming doors, the attitude, the staying in the house, in her room all day, trying to understand how her mind was changing quickly. And I was so confused. So I thought to myself, you know what? Instead of always shouting and trying to get her to, to be me or do what I knew when I was 14, why don't I try and bring her friends? engage them, try to understand if my daughter is actually normal, <laughs> if she's going to be like all the other youths. So I said to her, let me get to know your friends. So they would I created that home that young people would come and hang around. And I got to realize that my daughter was actually very good because I picked up a lot of behavior issues, I picked up a lot of um, tendencies that I realized, you know what, young people need help. So this is where I started my journey as a youth worker. Started off, as I said, formerly young people just coming to Auntie Dudu's house hanging around. But I also realized how lost young people were and how much support they needed. So that's how the Bell of Youth Matrix came about. So over the time, and I'll tell you a bit about the Youth Matrix. So at the Youth Matrix, um, our aim really is to elevate school, is to engage young people positively, keep them off the streets, keep them so occupied that they have no time for anything but something positive. So that's what we do. We run various uh, workshops. We run um, various projects, community projects. I mean, about two months ago, they, they did a window cleaning service. We just went around the local area cleaning windows for businesses, shops, schools, and they raised a lot of money, which we then sat down and said to the youth, right, this is how much you've raised, about 4,000 pounds, is it? Yeah. What do you want to do with these 4,000 pounds? They say we want to buy stationery for youths that are in deprived countries. And that's why I think we probably saw a Facebook post where we were saying anyone for stationery organizations, that's because of the work that they did. And we have now a project where they're doing car cleaning service, and then they're going to do a homeless challenge as well, where they're going to be sleeping in the streets just to see what homeless people go through, and they're going to get sponsors actually sponsoring them to actually spend two nights in the streets living around. Because what we're trying to do is to get them to understand every aspect of life. We're having an exchange program where they're all going to spend time in Africa, in Asia and different countries, just to go and see us. A lot of them have lost touch with their roots, they don't know who they are. So we're trying to get them to understand who they really are and also to embrace their wealth, not be ashamed of where they come from, but actually value it. Because I always tell them there's those of Haiti in Africa. And they all go really and say, yeah, we're going to go there and see. And when we go to Africa, we're not going to Lagos. We're going to the bushes. We're going to the sticks. We're
they're going to see real life, they're going to be milking cows, they're going to be farming, they need to know where food comes from. So that's what we do at the Youth Matrix. Um, unfortunately, with what's happening, the crime culture is something that's really um, affecting all of us. I mean, when um, Baba Tunde, what happened to him is one of our very dear ones at the Youth Matrix um, because he's an overseas student. And his mother said to me, Dudu, please, this is your son. When I'm not here, I'm in Nigeria, you are responsible. So suddenly, about three weeks ago, I got a phone call from Baba Tunde's mom. I think he had just broken off the summer, um, the summer holidays. And she was crying to me on the phone and she said, I don't know what's happening to Baba Tunde if you heard from him. I said, no. She said, um, because I called him and she, all he said was, Mom, I broke my jaw and that was all. And from there, his phone was switched off. I tried Baba Tunde's phone, I couldn't get hold of him. I asked all the friends, nobody knew where he was. So my daughter said, Mommy, I need to find him. She went round the hospitals and she found Baba Tunde in the hospital in Kent. And she rang me and said, Mom, I found him. Our good Samaritan, always find him. <laughs> I know where he is, and she gave me all the breakdown of what had happened. When I saw Baba Tunde, I just had to put a brave face. But it really broke my heart to think when you're innocent. And to be honest, this is why I said to myself, young people, I understand when they say to me, and to do we carry weapons not because we want to fight, but we want to defend ourselves. Now I can imagine if Baba Tunde had a knife that day to defend himself. We did not have used it, and where would he be? So this is where we are, I'm thinking, we need to create a safe environment because nobody is safe. You don't have to be in a game to, to get hurt. Anybody can get hurt anytime. So I've spoken to, um, I mean, in our organization, currently we have about 2,000 members, aged between 16 to 25. And I have spoken to a few that are victims and are also spoken to perpetrators because we have those as well. And the often things that have came about, when I say to the young people that offend, that attack others, that get involved in all sorts of things, what leads you to actually do that? What, what causes you to want to hurt another person? And what I've gathered is one, one, one youth said to me, I try and speak to my parents, but they don't hear me. They're always either at work or on the phone. When I come home and I want to tell them about my day, they don't hear me, but my friends get my back. My friends have my back. My friends have my attention. My friends think I'm the man. When I talk to my parents, they just tell me to go to my room and make noise. Attention, parents. We need to give our children time. That's where it all starts from. Because to be honest, crime, the amount of young people, is a symptom of a problem. The fact that they offend means there is a problem that is not solved. That's a sign. I've heard some of them saying, um, migration issues, that's another one. Where we brought our children to England because we wanted better opportunities. But we forget to prepare them for that change. Yeah? They come into England, at home want them to behave Zimbabwe and Nigerian, but the society wants them to be British. So as soon as they step out of your door, they want to fit in and be these British boys. And then they come home, you don't give that leeway, you want them to straight away be Nigerian or Zimbabwe or wherever they come from. And there's a lot of confusion amongst young people. They're already confused because they're at that stage of being in between an adult and a child anyway. So the confusion is even more when we don't support them through that change. Migration is a problem. They are not accepted. First of all, when they come in, there's an accent issue, they're trying to fit in, there's, there's food they don't know, there are things they don't realize, that. then they try and fit in quickly. So therefore, they easily misled. So we need to give a lot of support to our young children because there is a big problem there. The other issue as well that I found um, is absent parents. That's a big one. I'm not saying it's for this fault. Sometimes relationships do break. But when relationships do break, I think the parents that tend to stay with the child overcompensate for the parent that's not there. Therefore, we let children get away with things they shouldn't normally get away with. So I think again, we need to make sure we strike that balance. Because most times, parents don't know their children. I know that I have a lot of youths that I know more than their parents know them. Because I've had youth say to me, do you know what, I speak to you better than I speak to my mother. Because you give me time. And that's wrong. 
So we need to understand our children. We need to talk to our children. I remember, sorry, I'm going to say this. When I first spoke to Baba Tony and I tried to get the truth of what actually happened, he didn't want to tell me because he was worried, he didn't want to upset me, he didn't want to. He actually said he wasn't bad until I saw him and he was very bad. You see? And then, again, I wish he had told me this because right now those boys are walking nobody knows that they probably done it to somebody else so that's another situation and um, this whole gang issue is really affecting black people and I think it's time to stop waiting for support to come from elsewhere we need to do something about this <laughs> honestly it's got to a point where if we're going to wait for help to come from anyone else other than ourselves or kidding ourselves, we're going to end up with no news. We need to do something about this. We need to do whatever it takes. We need meetings like this. We need to create um, uh, committees that are going to really get in. We need to go to schools, universities, in the streets. Let's do our own campaigns. Let's talk to our young people. They are our children. Nobody's going to raise them for us. We need to do it. We need to direct them. Because, I mean, I've mentored Kay over there since, how old were you there? He was 15, now you're 22, right? Now Kay is 22. And all I can say to you is that we go through a lot, we see a lot of changes, we talk to young people, we know what they go through. We have someone who is already built, big, he's a youth, so far from you, but he's still a youth. His name is Emeka Ewan. This is, uh, I think this is the second time you have been to the chamber to speak. And you spoke the other time in the best of other places. He's an author. He's a lecturer. And I would say he's a role model to the leaders. He's a former network director of ICSN. You can call him president. He's come here to share his knowledge, experiences, and talk us through from your perspective on this issue in question. And after that, we have a lot of thanks. Emeka, put your hands together. Um, thank you um, for having me here today. Um, I'll go quickly into detail about some of the work that I've done over the last 15 years. Um, I started something completely different to what I eventually um, went on went to do. I studied computer science for a while and then leaving that industry to, to go into youth work because when I went back to my area in Hackney where I grew up. Um, I saw some of the changes within some of the young people and it sort of propelled me to think about what we actually need to do to be able to make change. And there was a significant moment in my life that gave me a deeper understanding and that was when I was 17. So growing up in, in an area of Hackney where there was a lot of gang activity at that time, this is sort of 2003, 2004, in between sort of leaving secondary school and my first year of college. And I remember this period specifically because it's, it's the period of change and, and I feel like so many different young people might experience this period of what can change their life depending on what path they go into. And I remember it clearly and this will go into understanding the problem, the bigger problem that we have within, within our society, within the UK. And I remember one of the guys in my area, he had a problem with another guy from another area. Um, long story short, it led to an altercation, one of the guys in my area got attacked. And then his, his response was to gather everyone from the area for retaliation. And so at that period of time, I was one of the first in the area that had my driver license. And so he called everyone in the area to come together. And I remember I got a phone call specifically saying, Alekha, we want you to we want you to drive to this retaliation. But little did they know in regards to some of the key events that happened leading before me making the decision that I feel like changed my life. Growing up, we see our parents working hard to try and elevate us to the next chapter in terms of doing everything they can to make sure that we elevate, that we become successful. And that includes time, the absence of time for financial gain, which is also part of the problem. 
Not by any good school, but just by the fact that we're just trying to survive, we're trying to elevate ourselves. So that lack of time, always see my mum wake up in the morning, even before we go to school. And then after, she, after we've come back, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, that's when she's coming in. And I remember one time when she came back late, and I calculated, I'm thinking, how many hours is, how many hours is shit? Because this doesn't even make any sense. And so at that point in time, I looked at my little brother, four years between us, and I said to him, said to him you know what, I'm going to make it my goal in life to try and retire my mom, to try and make life easier for her. So that gave me a purpose. Two days later, this situation that I told you about just occurred, where I'm now called to meet this group of guys, there's about 70 people, and then the aim is to retaliate. This is a lose-lose situation, and in this situation, this guy is a known guy in the area. Nobody says no because of how he looks. But at that time, straight away, I looked back and I said, if we go and we succeed, there might be a case. So you lose either way. So for me, the only thing that made sense was just to say, you know what, I'm not going. And I'll take whatever the consequences there and then. In essence, the guy even respected me for not doing something that I didn't want to do. Long story short, eventually the five guys that went into another car, they had four guns in that car. They were stopped on the way to retaliate. Each and every one of them, nobody owned up to the guns, so every single person joined Enterprise was sentenced for four or five years. That was the start of their criminal lifestyle. The last person, three, four years ago, I saw him, he committed another crime after going to prison several times, and for this time it's 20 years for just robbery. But that start in 2002, 2003 was the beginning of his criminal lifestyle. And I always use this to reference in terms of when I speak to young people and say that choice is important. <clears throat> I've done research and I've gone to America where I feel like there's a lack of choice in regards to how the gang culture works in America. It's totally different. Here, there's a lot of choice and a lot of young people choose this lifestyle. They choose this lifestyle because of peer pressure and the circles that they fall themselves around. I love to see a lot of people blaming parents and that's not always the blame. Too many people are on their high horses judging other parents for stuff that they know nothing about. You don't know how anybody else is raising their child for you to be judging anybody else. And I use another young person as an example. Two young boys that I worked with. One was a model student. His younger brother was a model student until he was attacked. Until he was attacked by another group of guys when he was coming home from another area. So rather than become a victim again, he became a perpetrator, worse than the people that attacked him. So his life of crime began when he, began when he got attacked. But you, some, somebody will now look at that boy 10 years from the point he got attacked, been to prison three, four times, kidnapped, drugs, you name it, guns, everything. He has Foxton M1 tattooed on his arm. The area tattooed on his arm. Somebody will look at him and they'll say, where, I wonder where the parents are. If, he, if I tell you every intervention that the parents have done, you'll never blame the parents. Church, community groups, every single person funded, no matter what, everybody, family members, uncles, everybody tried to intervene. But at that point, it was already too late. It was, it was the friendship groups that now become something more powerful. They get to a stage in primary school where you and everything you say to your child is, is like the Bible. In primary school. But where you lose them, because in primary school, you ask your child, how was the school today? They'll say, fine, but you did more, you asked more. What did you learn? You have a conversation. But when you get enter, when you enter year seven, year eight, some of these young people just say, oh, school is fine. And that will be the end of the conversation. You try big, but because of this adolescence, you don't want to push too much because you feel like they're teenagers, just give them your space. But no, I would suggest to pro and ask questions. Because the, the, the big difference with that, with these two brothers, when you say surely they were not raised in the same household, 
These are, these are Nigerian boys, in Yoruba boys. I've met their parents, strong parents, strong discipline. That school of discipline of study, education, everything, church, was a priority focus. But the stark difference was that attack that nobody knew about at the time when it happened, and the peer group that he decided to keep after that attack. That's what made a difference, and that's who became his family. So when your real family start talking, don't be surprised if they just block everything out. Because the more you try to inter interject, the more they block out what you're trying to what you're trying to do. So where do, where do we go from here in regards to when we're talking about the wider community in regards to what's happening in the UK right now? Having worked in the education system for the last 10 years, one of the things that I noticed, especially with young black boys, is the exclusion rate and how quickly they happen. And the disparities between some of the offences that are caused with some of these young black men and everybody else. So when a young black man, when a young black boy commits something that's minor, he's looked at as aggressive. Don't forget the education system in this country is predominantly middle-aged white women who are on the other end of the spectrum in terms of understanding the emotions of a young black boy. So when he says, when he's given an instruction and he doesn't respond the first time, doesn't necessarily make him a young um, aggressive individual. Whereas the else I've seen in the classroom, when before I even became a teacher, I was just a mentor in the classroom. And I see the exact same behavior by another boy, but treated in a different way. Some people might say, oh, it's this, it's that, it's because it's... No, ultimately there's a subtleness in regards to how they are treated. And eventually that fast tracks them to become excluded. And how does that make a difference? Once they become excluded, you're now fast-tracking them to a point of hopelessness. Of where, if they reach that point of, I don't care. Doesn't matter what you say, what the big brother says, what the parent says, because the, the friends that they meet outside, and especially when they're not put into those alternative education, where it's other young people from other schools who have been picked out, are now put into one group. Just put a prison outside of prison. So they're now locked together to now do less of an education. So from doing possible 13 GCSEs, you're now told you can only do two or three, if that. And even if you are doing the GCSEs, it's already capped. The highest you can possibly get is a D if you're lucky. So when you're telling somebody this, they already feel excluded from society, excluded from school, and excluded from any opportunity in terms of academics. And so nine times out of ten, statistics say that 47 percent of those people who are excluded end up in the criminal justice system. And when you get to that point of hopelessness, to the point where you do not care anymore, and depending on the type of activities that you engage with on the streets, we're now talking about knife, knife crime, violence against people that look like you. So, what's, so what do we do in regards to, I think everybody can equally identify some level of the problem because we, we, we can be here to, all day talking about problems and which particular things is causing this. But the, the, the question we now need to concentrate on is what is the solution in regards to giving young people that sense of hope in an era of hopelessness. And this is where I feel like it's our responsibility to take charge. Not isolated within our communities, but embracing every resources that we have to be able to make a difference. Control what you can control in your own household. That's the first thing you can do. Yeah? Control what you can control in your own household. That's the first thing you can do in terms of making sure your young people are not living a double life. So many young people are living a double life. Their parents will say, my child is okay. My child, I know my child. Nine times out of ten, that can be false. That can be false. Even my own younger brother who's 17. No matter all the work that I've done over the last 15 years. To say, my mama always used me as an example. Look at your older brother. Look at all the things that I've done. But the stress that he's causing them is different. Because there's a lack of respect. In this, in this younger generation as we, as, we, as, we, as we move forward. 
So she's now brought me in to, to, to have an eye to make sure I'm speaking to him. So little lies, oh yeah, he's gone to football. Then I'll be the one to probe. What time does football start? What time does football finish? He will say four o'clock. And my mom will take the four o'clock because why, why would it be any other time? What time did you leave? Football was nine minutes. How far are you going? Hackney Marshes, we live in Hoxton, so I don't understand disparities in time. So until I crawl, and I, I don't live at home anymore, but I'll be the one calling to make sure to understand where you are and what you're doing. And try to let him know that it is important to let the people you know where you are at all times. But even then, understanding that are we willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that our young people are not involved in what is happening on the streets and giving them every opportunity. Every opportunity. Without taking too much more of your time, I remember 2011 during the riots. I had this young man. We were doing a debrief on the riots. And I was like, who got involved in the riots? Some people put their hands up, some of them have already been charged, to know that they're going to prison for stealing bottles of water and things like that. And there's a young man that I was expecting to be part of the ones that put his hand up to say, yeah, I got involved. And I asked him a simple question when he said he didn't get involved in the riots. And I was like, why didn't you get involved? And he said, I started my MS job two weeks ago. And I was like, but even still, there are still people that have a job that still got involved. Why didn't you get involved? He goes, because now I've got something to lose. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. We need to give young people that sense of purpose within our communities. All we can do is give them that sense of purpose and put the opportunities there for them. I won't stand here and say that every young people that I've given an opportunity to have taken it. No, because I've got young people who called me from prison saying that Mecca should have listened to you. And I've seen those who have taken those opportunities now. I've, one of the young people I was working with about 10 years ago is now a director putting on shows in the theaters. He invited me to his first show in December last year. I was proud of him. And then he would say to me, it was, it was because I listened to you and everybody else in that youth club at that time that really cared for us, even without the funding, we were working from our homes to make sure that they had the support. And so it's giving these young people a sense of purpose, and that has to start from our households and con continuously to believe in the purpose that they have. Give them something to do, put them into something, especially from a young age. Right now we're talking about intervention and solutions for some people who are already in tracks. But what about those who are two, three years old? Right now. This time ten years ago, I was giving some of the speeches to some of those young people who were two, three years old then, who are now 15, 16, hardcore into it. Products of the environment, if you don't change the product, then it's going to continue to be the same. So we need to change the mindset, we need to start encouraging and working from home and pay more attention. Yes, we're all chasing financial freedom, but time, you can never substitute time, ever, in terms of the focus that you have in your young people. And part of that involves your history. Assuming the majority of us here are Nigerian, involves your own, no matter where you're from, there's a set of rich history. When I wrote my first book, it was the first time I actually delved into the effort. Speaking to my dad, some of the uncles that actually fought in that war. So the first chapter of my first book was about history and how that helped me in terms of why I wanted to read more. Gave me that sense of purpose, became more of a mentor around my peer group. Became a leader at that young age saying no to this, yes to this. And so around my peers, around parents, they, they sense that sense of, okay, this is a responsible person that's going somewhere. I want my child to be around that person. So history and culture, for us especially, plays a major role because it affected me, gave me that sense of pride as well. To say that my parents have fought hard to bring us here, I have no excuse. There's going to be time. This is my prayer answer. I've been working 13 years as a low ranger. Never ask funding because when they give you funding, your hands are tied. And singularly, with the grace of the Almighty,
you go to prison now, 10 black boys in prison, 8 are Africans. I repeat again. In prison now, uh, some of you are going to start. I'm just going to give you a test of what's to come. This is my family. I'm a mother for Chukwu Kadibia from the Demi Alamondo. So I'm going to be part of this. We're going to make it happen, but it's going to require drastic measures. Not the way the council, look, it doesn't work. The church failed. Council failed. This is the time for the apostle of the Demi Alamondo. This is the hookup right here. That generation, most of us here are from the eight-track generation. LP. This, this perpetrators are from the I have iPhone. Most of us cannot connect. You need me, and you need a maker. If not, you're wasting your time. Yes. I'm not going to waste your time because you're my people. I'm going to sacrifice the rest five, ten years to make sure for Hanese, Nigo, make it happen.
regards to what does our Hanadi need to do? And what we realized was basically he wanted to do certain things, which is one of them was to uh, have a growth development. Um, and then I said to him, well, I know what to do. And um, when he then talked about life and gun crime, I said, I know what to do. So I said I had to research and I get back to him and I did the research and I got back to him. And when I got back to him, you know, we developed, I developed a, a kind of a, a pamphlet with information to do with knife and gun crime. And I wanted the Hanese to start this as their first event. Why did I want that? Because it's about time. We know Ohanese and understand that Ohanese is the food full of all Igbo people and we recognize that. However, what is missing is we are in England. We have to draw through the system and we want to make sure drawing to the system is implementing different strategies to do so. And that's exactly what we did. So we created and uh, the planning committee, and here we are. And um, I am very glad because I wanted this to be compact. I didn't want it to have so many people. I wanted it to be fruitful and quality. I'm a creator, I'm not a follower. And I want everybody to realize creating and creating jobs, opportunity for young people is very, very important. And that is the essence of the reason why the young people are doing the things they're doing today. So basically, education, number one, and when I talk about education, yes, um, I heard Mr. Ebon say about the grants and funds. Yes, it's the truth. There's so many grants and funds out there. Apply for it constantly, you will fail. And why are we failing on the process? Is because we have not focused so much on the community. If the community comes together, we can get something started. We can get something moving. We can create a movement. And that movement has to start today. And that's the reason why I wanted to sponsor this today. So that on her knees, you can have the footprint, can have the ideology that I'm not only there for community and drinking and every day in a party, what we need to do is create fruitfulness, make our young people realize that we need to get something done. And that's what we're trying to do. So on I'm very happy to do this with Dr. Uwe. Um, I've liaised with him constantly and um, he's been a, a gentleman. Thank you Dr. Uwe for this. And, um, and also the main priority today was to bring certain things, activities that would help the Igbo community. So how do we get about doing this? It's not going to be easy because what happens is that when we try to do something, something happens. Like a child, they stumble and fall, but they still walk. So we can start somewhere and walk and get somewhere. And that's how everyone needs to understand that leadership is very, very important. Like I said, education, leadership is another aspect. Ohanese is here with a good leader, fantastic. However, effective people with skills and qualities within Ohanese would move Ohanese to a place Ohanese has to be. We will keep the culture, we're never actually going to change anything, but progression and moving forward is the main aspect of Ohanese. So that's what I thought Dr. Ige was going to achieve, and that's the reason why I'm here today. And um, um, thank you very, very much. I can say this. Um, um, we are here. There is a reason why we're recording this. We want people of the UK to realize this, that there is going to be a movement. There is going to be certain groups who are willing to move forward. We're not just going to say, okay, we put in a funding. No, that's not the only thing we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve other things. So by putting a footprint within the society, the system of Hanese being represented within the system for at 
achievers, for helping youths, providing different types of activities is the reason why we're here. I'm very, very passionate about that and that's the reason why I'm here too. Thank you very much, thank you. I hope that we have food available, so please be aware that the food is there to eat as much as possible because we eat, there is so much to eat. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. There's no point carrying guns. 